I'm Dr. Wally Bartfei, and I invite you to partake on an exciting educational journey related to public health theory, practice, and research. You shall discover on this learning adventure that the art and science of public health is inter- and multidisciplinary in nature, very complex and broad, and continuously evolving over time. In this lecture, we will examine Canada's healthcare systems and also examine the evolution of Medicare in Canada. So let's start by examining early boards of health in Canada during the 19th century. Well, Canada, as you can see from this map, was divided into basically upper and lower Canada. And we had, of course, the King's Domain and Rupert's Land to the north. Upper Canada was known as Ontario, basically, and Lower Canada as Quebec. And both of these uh, established boards of health in 1832 and 1833, respectively. They were mandated with enforcing quarantine and sanitation laws, and also stopping the sale of spoiled and rancid foods. They also imposed restrictions on immigration to help prevent the spread of communicable diseases. The British North American Act was uh, passed in 1867, and this is really the first legislation to describe the jurisdictions and responsibilities of the federal and provincial governments for providing health care services. The BNA Act was renamed the Constitution Act in 1982. So there are two sections that are critical in this BNA Act. So section 91 describes the role of the federal government in economic matters, things like taxation, regulation of trade, external affairs, defense, criminal law, and powers of reservations and disallowance. Also immigration and quarantine. So quarantine uh, falls under the uh, BNA Act in section 91. Section 92 is also critical because it describes the responsibility of provincial governments, which include things like education, civil law, agriculture, and of course, social welfare. Subsequent rulings um, in court have established that healthcare is in fact a provincial and or territorial jurisdiction. Of course, the federal government uh, re retains uh, jurisdictions for health pertaining to uh, individuals such as RCMP officers, the military, um, federal inmates in prisons as well. The first Department of Health was established in 1919. And we had the Canadian Census, our very first Canadian Census showed that we had a population of, of course, 3.7, approximately 3.7 million individuals. And of course, this warranted growing concerns for delivering public health care services. Department of Health was subsequently created and the federal government largely, by the federal government, largely in response to sexually transmitted infections, um, also tuberculosis or TB for short, and the growing recognition for the importance of keeping children healthy and safe. During the 18th and 19th century, medical quackery flourished during this period because of lack of standardized education and training by those who employed the title doctor of medicine. So over here, you see an example of a cure with Dr. Brigman's uh, magical rheumatism ring, which involves electromagnets magnets and so forth, which will apparently cure any, anyone who has uh, rheumatism. Here are some other examples. Uh, this is a one on the top left. You'll see for balmy oils and testimonials by various patients claiming that uh, by taking these substances, uh, their cancer was in fact cured. Of course, during this period of time, 
there was a lot of experimentation into magnets and electricity. Um, and of course, this one here claims that you will not require to use a crutch anymore and it will uh, cure all types of ailments, muscular and skeletal ailments. And you see the individual breaking a crutch here. And of course, radium. Uh, there used to be radioactive, believe it or not, water being sold and claiming to have various medical uh, benefits, including uh, the ability to cure uh, gout and rheumatism, um, to invigorate uh, men's uh, sexual drive, etc. When in fact, we know that this is highly toxic and resulted in impotency. Early 19th century medical education in Canada. Here we see a lecture hall where a patient is rolled out and the professor is giving a lecture to students and they're taking notes. So during the 1850s, students enrolled in medical schools attended these formal lectures, but in fact received very little instruction in laboratory type of settings. Dr. William Osler, 1870s, he was a Canadian physician who really revolutionized scientific lab-based medical education in North America and globally by introducing the use of microscopes and dissection into his anatomy classes. This was based on an increasing acceptance of the unicausal medical model of health. Now, what I find interesting here in this photo to the right is you see medical students, of course, uh, working on a cadaver, and of course, they don't have any gloves, etc., on them. A great source of infection to patients. Osler's legacy. He also introduced a system of postgraduate specialized organ-based medical training and education. This remains a standard worldwide today for medical specializations and also how we set up hospital units based on body organs and or systems. For example, nephrologists deal with problems associated with the kidneys, cardiologists for problems associated with the heart, dermatologists for problems associated with the skin, and psychiatrists for mental health problems. Here we see a medical model of health depicted, or as a, if you want, as a robot. So this model of health comprehends the human body as a contraption or apparatus that is very similar to a robot in which all components or parts are, they're interconnected, However, they are capable of being replaced or treated separately and therefore in isolation by these various specialists. Health, according to the medical model of health, is achieved when all biological components or parts of the body function properly. The mechanistic medical model of health consequently becomes the standard for health services and interventions. If a component is not functioning properly or ultimately, then medical interventions are consequently required. For example, devices like pacemakers and or surgery to repair or replace a defective heart valve or entire heart. Here we see uh, on to the right, an early internal pacemaker device. This is another Canadian invention, by the way. And it was roughly the size of a hockey puck. Today, they're, they're, they're quite small in nature and flat. Health promotion and prevention, of course, were put on the back burner as a consequence of this medical model of health and education. The Carnegie Foundation commissioned Abraham Flexner to write a report related to medical education and training in the United States and Canada. It is notable that Flex Flexner was a schoolmaster or principal, if you wish, by occupation, 
and had no formal medical education or training whatsoever. He visited a total of 155 medical schools in Canada and the United States, and he claimed he could assess, literally in a matter of hours, whether the school met scientific standards or not based on the causal lab-based medical model of health. As a consequence of his report, alternative schools of medicine were closed and the new scientific paradigm became the established universal standard and benchmark for medicine to follow. So what are the consequences of this report? Although his report lacks any credibility by any current standards, his report had major impact on the evolution and definition of health and also medical education and training in Canada and globally. Alternative medical schools were closed due to the lack of funding and scientific credibility. Hence, a new breed of physicians was uh, created, which closely adhered to the unicausal lab-based disease model of health. Notions like prevention and health promotion, caring for the whole individual or a, a holistic model, and for rehabilitative therapies were virtually ignored in these new curriculums. The report was also in, instrumental in establishing medicine as a self-regulating profession globally. During the 20th century, we see a shift in primary practice settings. So previously physicians mostly practice in, in the community type of settings. They would go into patients' home, they would deliver babies and so forth. And often people who are a little bit well off often had a sick room in their house as well. But the growth of laboratory-based medical model of health with its increased reliance on technology, things like new x-ray machines, electrocardiograms, and various laboratory-based blood tests uh, were being employed to make uh, clinical diagnosis. This resulted in a shift of practice from private homes and community settings to hospitals because the average physician could not afford these new medical technologies and devices, so they became centralized in hospitals and hence practice became centralized also in these locations. Here we see a, 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 a photo, an early photo of a physician taking an x-ray of a young lady. Of course, we didn't realize during this period of time many of the hazards associated with being exposed to, to x-rays. A similar story also happened with nurses across Canada during the 20th century. After World War II, over 70 hospital-based training schools for nursing were in fact established. Hospitals therefore became centralized places for both training medical and nursing personnel and also to receive healthcare services and to undergo various diagnostic tests. Tommy Douglas is regarded as the father of Medicare in Canada, and he was the first to introduce a Medicare-based system in Saskatchewan in 1959. And this particular model was based on the needs of the individual as opposed to their individual ability to pay. This is a critical model because it served as a sort of a blueprint for subsequent provincial Medicare systems across Canada. So what is Medicare? Well, Medicare is basically a collective term by which residents in Canada refer to our publicly funded and administered universal health insurance systems. The word systems is used in plural here because there are a variety of systems across Canada. Currently, currently there is one federal, 10 provincial and three territorial jurisdictions for the delivery of publicly funded health care services. The federal government is uh, responsible uh, for um, Indigenous health, 
for the large part, uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Mountain Police, the military, and, and veterans, of course. And these, these were first outlined in the British North America Act. The National Health Grants of 1948 really marked the federal government's role in partially subsidizing public, provincial, and territorial health care systems via tax-based systems, where the governments would collect taxes, of course, and distribute them accordingly across, uh, across the various provinces and territories. This provided sort of grants in aid for an assortment of acute, episodic, hospital-based services and projects, which included the construction of new hospitals, laboratory services, and the training of physicians and nurses here, again reinforcing that notion of uh, hospitals are where people go for education and training to become a healthcare professional and also where they receive these healthcare services and diagnostic tests. Justice Emmett Hall was commissioned in 1964 to write a, a royal, uh, had a royal commission. And he, uh, what he did is he charted, started to examine nationally the picture of what people wanted and needed. And he came up with two major recommendations. The first one was that a nationwide publicly funded or tax-based health insurance plan be established and modeled based on Saskatchewan system, which Tommy Douglas first initiated. And number two, that public health care insurance plans should be extended to include physician services administered outside of hospital settings. Hall also urged that the 145 private health insurance companies across Canada be replaced by provincial and territorial publicly funded health insurance plans. Of course, this whole notion about uh, publicly funded health care uh, was supported by businesses and corporations, by various unions, and by the public themselves. HITSA, or the Hospital Insurance and Diagnostic Services Act, came about in 1957. And under this act, the provinces and territories would continue to direct their own health insurance plans, but the federal government would agree to cover 50% of the associated cost of specified public health care services uh, provided in hospitals. Five provinces immediately agreed to the terms of the act because of their associated provincial health care savings. The Medical Care Act of 1966 uh, stated that each province and territory was free to administer their own unique health insurance plans as they deemed appropriate, as long as it conformed to the criteria of the MCA, which included these uh, critical elements. It had to be universal, portable, had to have comprehensive coverage, and of course, public administration. What are some of the tax-based implications of HITSA and the Medical Care Act? Well, collectively, they established a formula for federal transfer payments to the provinces and territories to help cover the cost of acute hospital-based health insurance plan that employed a formula of 50 cents to the dollar. So 50 cents would be paid by the provinces or territories and the remaining 50 cents would be paid by the federal government. So what are some of the implications? Well, this funding scheme dramatically reduced home and community-based public health services and national public health promotion and prevention strategies. These were really put on the back burner during this period of time. Funding was also limited to physician-driven, hospital-based acute care services things like various diagnostic tests and surgery. It also reinforced the physician's positions as so-called gatekeepers to healthcare diagnostic services and medical specialists. So here on the right, we see a huge door 
with a young lad banging on it. And this huge door is used to symbolize the inability, powerlessness, and frustration of clients to access various publicly funded healthcare and or diagnostic and imaging services without being first cleared by a physician who acts as a gatekeeper to these vital amenities. And it's the same sort of system that we have in existence today. Services of many other healthcare professionals would cost a fee. So things like occupational therapy, uh, if you wanted to go see a physiotherapist to receive rehabilitative services, an audiologist to check your ear, an optometrist to, to do vision care, or a chiropractor, uh, these would all come out of pocket. Hence, physicians became the first choice for most people, and it remains so today. After implementation of the Medical Care Act, healthcare expenses soared due to medical fees for services and diagnostic services. The Federal Provincial Fiscal Arrangements and Establishments Programs Financing Act, or EPF Act for short, uh, came about. Well, and how did this come about? Well, in the 1970s, healthcare costs really continued to escalate. And by 1976, the total health expenditures in Canada exceeded $13 billion annually. Hence, to save money, the federal governments decided to alter this sort of 50-50 cost-sharing formula to some to so-called per capita block grants by passing the EPF. What are some social consequences of this EPF? And here we have a description by Armstrong and Armstrong. Well, basically this approach to funding was designed to encourage provinces to move as many people as possible out of expensive acute care institutions and into less expensive care in residential facilities and in private homes where much of the care was provided without pay by female relatives typically. Rather than challenge the medical model, this move reinforced it by assuming both that a clear line could be drawn between the so-called curable patients and incurable patients, and that the curable needed less care and less skilled care. During the 1970s, uh, there was increased concern about the rising cost of Medicare and the growth of physician-driven private for-profit clinics across Canada. Monique Bégin, who was the Federal Minister of Health and Welfare, believed that extra billing, user fees, and private for-profit clinics posed a serious threat to the survival of Medicare in Canada. Hence, she introduced Bill C-31, or also known as the Canada Health Act, uh, for so-called medically necessary procedures. The Canada Health Act is based on the following five fun, uh, founding criteria. It had to be publicly administered, had to be comprehensive in nature, had to be universal, portable, and of course, accessible for all residents. But that sort of concept of what is medic medically necessary is very subjective in nature and open to wide interpretations. Since the Canada Health Act does not specify or detail which medical and surgical interventions or diagnostic tests should actually be insured, the range of insured health care and diagnostic services varies greatly across Canada and by province and territory. So here's an example. Um, here we see a surgeon in Ontario may clinically determine that a breast reduction is a medically necessary procedure for a 25-year-old female patient because of associated neck and back pain and muscle strain and problems sleeping. Conversely, another surgeon in the very same province of Ontario may simply determine that the same patient should undergo an elective cosmetic procedure, known as a breast reduction, 
since her condition does not warrant a medically necessary surgical intervention. So as you can see, the term medically necessary can vary quite greatly between one physician and another, even within the same province. What are some other consequences of the Canada Health Act? Well, this has been instrumental in perpetuating the dominant medical model of health since, since the turn of the century. It also reinforced physicians' position as gatekeepers to diagnostic and episodic acute healthcare services. Concepts like the social determinants of health, holistic definitions of health, and the need for health promotion and prevention and rehabilitation have not been adequ adequately incorporated into current healthcare funding schemes. What does the term publicly funded mean? Well, this refers to a tax-based system to support healthcare services rendered in public hospitals, community clinics, and or institutions in Canada. There's a common myth that it covers all healthcare services and diagnostic uh, tests Canada-wide, but of course, these vary greatly by province and territory. For example, some provinces and territories uh, do cover chiropractors um, uh, such as Manitoba, where it is not covered in others, or in vitro fertilization may be covered in Quebec or, or in Ontario up to a certain amount, but is not covered in other provinces. What does the term privately funded mean? Well, this refers to out-of-pocket healthcare services that an individual has to pay themselves or it may be paid by their own private insurance plan or benefit that they may receive as part of their employee health benefits, some dental plan, eye exam and prescriptions each year. Um, Canadians pay approximately $800 in uh, 2018 alone for out-of-pocket uh, expenses. So are your healthcare dollars being spent wisely? Well, a very interesting report by Choosing Wisely and Kai Hai in 2017 uh, kind of shed some light onto this question. And what they found was, in fact, more than 1 million potentially unnecessary diagnostic tests and treatments are performed each year in Canada. Examples include uh, ordering routine chest x-rays, electrocardiograms, and cardiac stress tests for low-risk clients undergoing day surgery procedures. In 2018, total health expenditures in Canada were in excess of $242 billion, or over $6,600 per person. And this represents 11.5 of Canada's gross domestic product. Hence, healthcare expenditures are, are a huge uh, portion of the pie for health, for health. Here we see a graph that I put together looking at the rising healthcare expenditures in Canada for the years 1975 to 2018. And these are in billions of dollars. And of course, what you can see is healthcare expenditures continue to rise exponentially. This, in fact, will continue to rise over the next years and decades to come as baby boomers uh, become senior citizens in Canada. And of course, as we age, the incidence of non communicable chronic diseases, such as heart disease and stroke and diabetes and other ailments, of course, increase as well. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for listening to this mini lecture, and I hope that you listen to others in this mini lecture series re related to the art and science of public health. Thank you.